So welcome everyone once again to another episode of Confabulating. Um, let me thank you, Professor Hans van Wies, for accepting uh, our invite to be here with us uh, tonight. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. And thank you, Peter and Pedro, for being with me as well. Uh, professor Hans van Wies has been a world professor of ancient history since 2011, having previously held posts as lecturer, reader, and professor since joining UCL history uh, in 1995. Uh, his research centers on the archaic period of uh, Greek history, 750, 450 BC, but also includes the classical period and its focus above all on development in society, economy, and warfare, which we will be speaking tonight. And Professor Van Wies, you have a PowerPoint for us, right? I do, yes, thank you very much. Thank, um, I'll uh, try and uh, share that now. Um, and hopefully everyone can, uh, let's see, here we go. Yeah. Uh, everyone can see that. It's not, uh, sorry, it's not working perfectly. No worries. Uh, okay, well, I can, uh, I can see uh, <laughs> A version of the PowerPoint. Okay, well, uh, no, it's fine. We can, we can see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks again very much for inviting me and for allowing me to uh, to speak on my favorite topic. I hope <laughs> to, uh, to others as well. Um, yeah, I thought I'd give a, an into a, a, a brief presentation. Um, not so much about Greek warfare as a whole, but you know, which is too wide a topic to to usefully say much about. But uh, one interesting aspect, I think, which is the um, the role, the significance maybe of that iconic figure from Greek warfare, the so-called hoplite, you know, a heavy armored infantryman, big round shield, uh, fighting with hand-to-hand uh, -hand with, with a spear uh, in a dense formation. Uh, really an emblem of, of Greek warfare for, for many people. Um, but as you see from my, my subtitle, I'm asking what's so special about Greek heavy infantry? And by putting it like that, uh, maybe you already get the, uh, the idea that I think maybe in the end, uh, there isn't anything that special about uh, Greek heavy infantry, which is not to say Greek warfare is not an interesting uh, topic of study, but it seems to me important to, you know, to bear in mind um, uh, a broader perspective and to see what, what else is going on. And the, the title, The Other Hoplites, uh, indicates that I think uh, there are many uh, similar uh, other uh, hoplites in the ancient world and and Greece is part of that and not an exceptional um, case and just so the, the the some some of the slides are very detailed but I'll just um, summarize briefly what it says uh, this is a couple of examples of how uh, ancient Greeks themselves um, uh, uh, you know uh, flatter themselves by uh, claiming uh, that they are far superior warriors to anyone else in specific um, and so the first passage is from Herodotus, uh, Greek historian Herodotus, on the Persian Wars, where he claims that uh, a key battle, uh, the Battle of Plataea in that war, was lost by the Persians to the Greeks because the Persians were, anoplos, the Greek word, anoploi, uh, they didn't have the Greek equipment, but also they were inexperts and they were less intelligent, and so it goes on. There's a, a, a list of the reasons, according to this historian, why Persians are much worse. Uh, than, than Greeks. Uh, and at the bottom of the same slide, to skip to that uh, uh, classic example of a Greek self-representation from Xenophon, this time Xenophon's work Anabasis, uh, again Greeks versus Persians, a, a phalanx of Greek hoplites charges at a run at the Battle of Pudaxa, and before they even came within bowshot, the barbarians, that is the Persians, yielded and ran. This is the effortless superiority of the, the Greek uh, hoplites according to themselves. Um, and this is picked up by modern historians as well. I give you a few quotations, a uh, famous historian, Victor uh, Davis Hansen. Um, well, you see it in front of you. They, like the German soldier of 1940-41, the, the Greek hoplites uh, drew an almost smug assurance about his own natural superiority, etc. Et uh, uh, that about the weapons and the more recent quote from John Hale, uh, even claiming that the Greeks uh, began to surpass all other dwellers around the Mediterranean in physical strength and toughness. I mean, he doesn't quite explain how they did that. But, you know, this is part of this self self image of Greeks that is projected by modern scholars. So um, here, I think the historian should um, kind of intervene and you know try to try and decide 
what basis there is for this kind of self-image. Again, a detailed slide, but the point to make here is, is simply that this Greek historian Herodotus in, in other contexts um, actually is well aware that there are other people who have very similar equipment to Greek hoplites. Um, the second um, bullet point, the Carians who live in south, um, the Southwest Turkey, uh, neighbors of the Greeks effectively, he's, you know, they're equipped like the Greeks, it's essentially the same. Uh, and elsewhere, he says it's actually the Carians uh, rather than the Greeks who invent some of these features of Greek, uh, Greek equipment. So quite a different perspective. Um, it, this is quite well known, but less well known or less well, less often noticed is that he also says the Lydians, more neighbors of the Greeks in Western Turkey, uh, had equipment very similar to that of the Greeks. And that's actually confirmed by this much earlier poet, Greek poet, at the bottom of the slide, talking about, you know, in about 600 BC, talking about still earlier war, where he uses a poetic phrase, you know, fencing themselves with hollow shields, which is what Greeks use, Greek poets use of Greeks as well. But here he's talking about these Lydians. So there's certainly also evidence of an awareness that Greeks are not unique in this type of equipment. Um, little picture here, not very good quality, I'm sorry. Um, the middle band of the silver perfume bottle show, which is from Lydia, uh, shows uh, figures fighting that you can't really distinguish from, I don't know if you can see my cursor but over here, figures fighting that uh, you can't really distinguish from Greek hoplites. And a quotation there from a, a historian of, of ancient warfare who boldly says it's useless to try and distinguish Greek from Lydian warfare. Um, there's no difference. So that's a different perspective, uh, equally quite possible. Um, going a bit further still, and um, I don't think this has been suggested, but um, uh, perhaps you've heard of the Phoenicians. Uh, arguably, they too have hope lights. Um, there's this very nice ostrich, uh, engraved ostrich egg from about the 7th century BC, which shows figures, again, look exactly like those Greek hope lights, the helmets, the shields, the spears. Um, uh, a drawing uh, from a silver bowl on the on the right, uh, also Phoenician made, um, similar looking figures. Uh, usually, in modern historians say, "Oh, well, for some reason, it's Phoenicians drawing pictures of Greek hoplites." <laughs> but uh, I think it's perfectly possible, uh, indeed likely, that this is Phoenicians drawing pictures of Phoenicians who are equipped in a very similar way to Greek hoplites. And the quotation at the bottom. Um, as Herodotus again, actually saying that, you know, that they had helmets, the Phoenicians had helmets, very similar to the Greek ones, uh, linen corslets like the Greeks and aspides shields, round shields without a rim. So like those of the, the Greeks, but without the wide rim. And uh, the picture really does suggest, the picture of the, the, the silver bowl uh, suggests it precisely that smaller, but still similar shields. Um, so, um, slightly more extended, but my final uh, example of how Greek hoplites are not all that unique in the, in the ancient world, um, comes from Egypt, um, <clears throat> where uh, partly we have another sort of self-glorifying Greek story, which seems to suggest that uh, Egyptians are amazed at, at Greek uh, heavy-armed um, heavy infantry. Uh, famous story in Herodotus, again, um, Greek hoplites land in, on a raiding expedition, land in Egypt, and a local Egyptian is just stunned He says there are men of bronze coming out of the sea because allegedly he's never seen bronze armor before. Uh, and then the Egyptians generally are so impressed. They, the kings, the pharaohs hire tens of thousands of Greek mercenaries and um, they become like the main army in Egypt. And the, um, the, the image on the, on the right, uh, an Egyptian statue with a Greek in, inscription from about 600 BC. Um, actually reflects the, the presence of Greek mercenaries in Egypt. So this is a, a Greek who's been to Egypt, has got an Egyptian statue, put his uh, uh, boast on it and then dedicated it at home back in, in the Greek world. Um, so, um, so that's uh, the, the idea that Greeks are so superior that they're much in demand as mercenaries in, in Egypt. But then again, if you look in other texts, you will find it looks like the, the Greeks in other contexts recognize Egyptians too have very effective, heavily armed, uh, close combat fighters themselves, you know, that they don't necessarily need Greeks to, uh, to do the fighting for them. Um, Herodotus again describing um, Egyptian soldiers in, serving in the Persian army. Again, hollow shields um, like the Greeks and the Lydians with wide rims this time, um, all kinds of equipment. Uh, cuirasses, um, 
uh, made of iron rather than bronze, but still metal like body armor, uh, and swords, but large swords rather than spears, so even closer combat. Um, and these are like a professional warrior class in Egypt. And there's an interesting quote right at the bottom in, in blue on your screen uh, from a gr later Greek historian who actually says these Egyptian soldiers are invincible in their courage and experience. So that's quite a different perspective, uh, which suggests the Egyptians are the superior ones. Um, and it's perhaps not surprising you go all the way back to the Bronze Age, famous reliefs from the Ramesseum um, in, in uh, Thebes in Egypt. Um, especially the picture, the black and white picture on the right, you see these chariots, but in the middle of them, this um, extremely dense, well-organized rank and file formation. Uh, so that, I don't know how clear that is, but these are soldiers with large shields held upright, marching side by side and holding single spears like that. As well. So very much kind of a classic uh, dense formation. The, the shape of the shield is different, but in other ways, these could be Greek hoplites. And this is in the, in the Bronze Age, never mind. Uh, Iron Age. Um, actually, I'll skip this slide, but this is just to say, surprisingly and annoyingly, we don't actually have any evidence for what uh, Egyptian soldiers looked like in the early Iron Age or um, around 600 BC. Um, but again, we do have plenty of Greek texts that are expressing um, uh, admiration for for Greek um, for Egyptian, sorry, hoplites more than Greek even. Uh, Plato. Uh, who has an you know, imagined di um, dialogue between an Egyptian priest and the Athenian statesman Solon, um, in which the priest says, um, towards the end of that quotation, um, we, i.e. Egyptians, were the first people in Asia, I, you know, anywhere outside Europe, maybe, to arm ourselves um, with shields and spears. And you, the Greeks, the Athenians, were the first to do that in your part of the world, in Europe. So this is the idea the Egyptians invented this type of fighting with uh, sword and spear and the Greeks after them. Um, and again, that's just, you know, fiction, but um, we've got Xenophon yet again, actually describing Egyptians in the Persian army, um, wooden shields reaching to their feet even. These are absolutely huge, much bigger than Greek shields. Um, uh, again, the next passage in red, large Dorata spears, such as they still have today. Um, uh, he calls them hoplitai, hoplites. You know, he uses the exact same term. He describes their formation as a phalanx, the same term as for the Greeks. It doesn't look as if um, Xenophon, who himself was a mercenary, uh, a general, uh, a soldier, um, who knows a lot about Greek warfare, doesn't seem to think in this context that uh, Greeks are vastly superior to Egyptian soldiers at all. And uh, just above the blue, um, there's a reference as well to a passage where Xenophon also calls the Assyrians, uh, yet another ancient, big ancient empire, hoplites, as if there's no difference there either. Um, well, it goes on, but this passage is too long, but this passage really describes how these Egyptians fight. And in detail, it's exactly like a description of hoplites fighting, close combat, pushing and shoving with shields. Um, and again, Xenophon repeatedly says, this is what they're like even now. It's not, it's not uh, only in the past, but even nowadays, Egyptians are just like Greek hoplites. Um, I'll, I'll skip this one altogether and come to the last slide, which you know, draws the conclusions or raise, raises the points that this talk has served to, uh, to address. Um, you know, so if, if even Greeks themselves thought that um, uh, Egyptians had some really seriously good uh, heavy infantry. Uh, why did Egyptians hire hoplites? Um, uh, my suggestion would be that actually they hired hoplites be simply because they needed manpower and not because they needed uh, specialist uh, types of troop that no one else had, but that they could always do with more soldiers, specifically with soldiers that were uh, full time, that were you know always um, at their disposal, uh, and actually also soldiers that could be uh, that could multitask. I think were as naval personnel because the Egyptians, uh, what with the Nile and the Mediterranean and the Red Sea, they needed a lot of uh, naval personnel, and the Greeks were actually pretty uh, um, efficient at that. So that may actually be a reason even more than land warfare for them, and that's in itself is you know that's not what the Greeks like to emphasize, but this might be a, a significant historical reason. Uh, why they were in demand. Um, and then the, you know, the big historical question, um, why did the hoplite and the phalanx actually develop in ancient Greece? Um, the usual answer um, to that is, is not really an answer to why, but just 
in the quotation on the right, say, well, it, it is definitely an essentially Greek development. This is unique. You don't find that anywhere else. It's part of this uh, exceptional uh, status of, of, Greek, uh, of ancient Greece in history. Uh, this is one of the many unusual things that they do. Um, why in a Greek uh, Greek genius, I suppose, is the implied uh, implied answer. Um, you know why they did develop a degree hoplite and phalanx is, is a very difficult question to which I'm not sure I have a clear answer. But I would only say if we're asking that question, uh, we need to say, you know, why did anyone develop uh, hoplite type troops and and phalanx type formations in the ancient world? Because um, uh, as I hope to have shown, and there, there's a lot more evidence that I could uh, um, adduce. Um, it is actually um, the case that the Greeks are only part of a much wider development uh, towards this type of fighting uh, in, in the Bronze Age and in the Iron Age, in all kinds of states and empires. Um, and that's it, by way of introduction. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Wies. Um, maybe as, as a first question, if you allow me, um, and because obviously through all of your presentation and what you have been showing in terms of, for example, the Phoenician, the Egyptians, um, can we say that um, the hoplites are more of what they were than what the type of people they are? Um, yes, I mean, that's one way of putting it. I mean, so certainly there are, um, uh, well, they're named after what they were for a start. You know, hoplites just means someone who wears hope like you know equipment actually it just means people with equipment <laughs> it's a very kind of neutral name but what it's understood is that they uh, above all the, the the shield i think um and so uh, you know if, if that's not, if you don't have a shield you're not a hope like that's fundamentally what they're they're saying um uh, so it's um there is certainly a perception that when you have that equipment, it brings with it a certain set, you know, a certain set of attitudes, a certain social and economic status, even. So maybe there is an element of um, there are, you know, a special kind of people. Um, I, I would suggest, and this is a whole different uh, angle to the story, but um, uh, I would suggest that actually um, in the early period that I've mainly been looking at, um, the numbers of actual hoplites in the Greek world are quite small because it's really only um, the pretty rich who can afford all this equipment and the training and the time off to go and do the fighting. Um, so that it is kind of an elite, uh, an elite thing. Um, and therefore that there is, um, it becomes part of this Greek identity as a, as a sort of elite type of warrior. Um, but later on, you know, when we're moving into the classical period from which a lot of my other quotations came, um, it's much more, you know, there are many more people with at least the shield and the spear, if not necessarily all the other equipment. And then they become a different kind of person, a much more, you know, a middle or lower status uh, group, which is not so special. But at the same time, they retain this idea that um, they're at least better than the, the very poor uh, who don't have any of this equipment uh, or, you know, other, other nations who uh, rely on different kinds of fighting. So... Yes, I think you're right. It's fundamentally just what you, you know, what equipment you have that sets you apart. But the Greeks build a whole set of values on this that 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 claims that it's also the kind of people that they are. And basically, again, it's it's a lot about the money that you had back then mm. and the possibilities that you had for you to buy this type of equipment to make you able to yeah. to, to be a hoplite. And, Absolutely, and, and, yeah, yeah. And, it, it, and it is very important that yes, you, you as, as you as you say, um, you need to buy your own equipment. It's not um, it's not like you join the army and then they give you the equipment uh, as as in a modern army, I suppose. Um, no, you need to be able to afford the equipment, um, and then you can join the army. Um, and and so uh, there are some, you know, there are some some laws and regulations in some parts of Greece, but you know, I won't go into into that. But certainly, it's, it, there are there's like a, a, a like a census threshold almost. And if you got if you got a certain minimum amount of money above that, you're obliged to provide this equipment. If you haven't got that money, you're encouraged you know, to provide it if you want to be, you know, uh, one of the boys. <laughs> but you're not then obliged. So it's a really complex and interesting combination of kind of moral pressure, legal obligation, and having the money to uh, to do it. Really fascinating stuff. Um, certainly with that sort of the way in which um, hoplite identity 
it was very closely tied to sort of their social standing and place in society. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that really interests me is that, um, was there any evidence of um, hoplites perhaps having any kind of political stake in the city states that they served or any kind mm -hmm. of, did sort of the politics city states um, at all sort of feed into them and vice versa? Was there sort mm -hmm. of any evidence of that sort of thing going on? Mm -hmm. Yes, oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, this is this, so the 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 idea of hoplite being an elite status is not just a social elite, but it's very much tied in with uh, political um, status as well. Um, <clears throat> uh, actually, this is this is quite for, for a long period in Greek history. This is like I think the dominant um, value, the idea that, um, and you find it, you know, it's, it's most prominent, most famously expressed by Aristotle. You know, philosopher Aristotle has a as a whole thing on this, that uh, it's, you know, the, the best kind of state, the best kind of government is that in which um, the whole plights share, I, you know, not everyone, you know, out and out democracy is too much. Uh, uh, oligarchy and monarchy are not, are not great, it's too few people, but it's something in the middle uh, is what he likes and what he thinks of as the middle is having basically the hope light. So the sold, the heavy armed infantry soldiers uh, also be the political class. So that's kind of an ideal. Um, and what's interesting to me is that there are in different periods of Greek history, uh, different parts of the Greek world, there are different takes on that where, you know, for so for example, when uh, actually the main, um, well, where, where you do have a democracy, like a, in classical Athens, and you know, a much wider democracy, you actually get a different spin on this idea. People say, well, Hope lights, you know, they're all right, but you know, they're not that great. Actually, it's the the naval, you know, the rowers, the naval personnel that are, you know, that make this state, that are the basis of our power. And this is why everyone shares in our democracy. Or at the other extreme, where you have an oligarchy, people say, oh well, you know, the navy is fundamentally a bad thing. Uh, hope lights are okay, but not the most important. What, what matters is the cavalry, which is us, you know, the oligarch, uh, the oligarch. So. Um, it's always possible to put a, a spin on that in order to justify whatever political regime you you prefer and, and i stress that because there is in among greek historians quite a long tradition of actually uh, making warfare and the rise of the hope like the kind of primary driver and you know okay so this happened in warfare hope lights became important and therefore you got this kind of halfway democracy or the navy became important and therefore you got full scale democracy. But I think it, it's, the balance is probably the other way around that um, there are other factors that change the political system and um, the, um, uh, the justification for that is then drawn from warfare by proclaiming whoever, whoever shares in power the most important soldiers. Um, and if you allow me, there is a question from someone who is watching us, which is, uh, his name is Gonzalo Murta. And his mm -hmm. question is, what was so important on the type of phalanx type of fighting? Mm -hmm. uh, in, important about the type of fight? Yeah. So the, um, the reason it was, um, so the reason the Greeks say it is special is, is um, uh, partly the weapons that we've talked about, the armor, uh, but it's ab above all, I guess, the discipline and the cohesion. I think um, the, the very first quote that I skipped over very quickly makes a point uh, about that, that the, these Persians allegedly, they're just basically, they're do each doing their own thing. There is no, uh, no sense of cohesion or discipline. Uh, whereas Greeks, you know, they they fight in order, they stay together, you know, they never leave anyone behind, but they also don't, don't run forward like madmen, you know, they, they fight in line and in order. And so, and there's a strong sense among the Greeks that this is something they're excellent at, and also that other people are simply actually not only don't do, but are incapable of doing, you know, because they're not Greeks, they don't know discipline, they don't know this kind of solidarity and cohesion. Um, and, and so, um, whether in reality, you know, in terms of winning battles, uh, this type of formation was very important or decisive, is quite hard to tell because our, our sources, you know, the historians that write about this in, in ancient Greece, uh, pretty much ignore everything else and only talk about these, these phalanxes in, in action. Um, so they think it's important. Um, but we, you know, there we have hints enough to, um, to be able to tell that there are, well, there's cavalry, but also there are often very large numbers of so-called light arms or sometimes very light arms, you know, like tens of thousands of people who just chucking stones at the enemy or, you know, maybe have bow and arrow or, or javelins. 
Um, and these um, are played down by our, our sources and therefore also modern historians often think they're not, you know, they're not capable of achieving anything very much. It's all about the hope light and the phalanx. Um, as I say, it, it's quite hard to know whether this is um, true uh, in, in practice. Um, I, I would think that it really depends on what kind of war you're fighting, you know, what your aims and objectives are. There are some things that you could do actually much better with light armed, uh, possibly like things like siege warfare or, um, you know, highly mobile uh, campaigns. Um, hope lights are, and phalanxes are not good at all for that. But if you're waging a, you know, big sort of pitched battle in an open plain, then you're probably better off with these uh, quite heavily armed types that, um, uh, that can force uh, a decision, you know, by, by sort of claiming the battlefield and standing their ground in a way that light arm tend not to do. So, um, yeah, sorry, it's a very long-winded answer, but what's so important about the phalanx is it, uh, it, it depends very much on, um, uh, on what, uh, what kind of warfare um, um, you're, you're waging. Um, and that is sorry to make a long-winded answer even longer. Uh, that in itself is quite hard to tell about you know ancient uh, about ancient Greece, in that there is a perception um, very strongly advocated by by Victor Davis Hansen, who I had in there as one of the early quotations, um, that uh, Greek warfare is essentially confined for a long period of time, confined um, to phalanxes of hope lights fighting one another. You know, no, but literally nobody else plays any part. It's just it's like it's almost like a game. It's like a, uh, you, you put your players in the field and you see who wins and then and then it's done. Um, it might only take an afternoon or a morning to fight a battle and the war is over. Um, so if that is if that were true, um, then you say, well, the phalanx is everything. There is nothing else matters, really. Um, but given that we do have references to quite different kinds of campaigns, uh, as I say, siege is much more mobile fighting, guerrilla type fighting, naval warfare. Uh, perhaps in the bigger picture, the phalanx is maybe not that important. Yeah. And uh, there is another question as well, which is basically, if if we have information enough, if the professor can just give us a slightly comparison between uh, the the Egyptians uh, and uh, mm. the the Greeks in terms of oplites and how they they they, mm. they, they engage in warfare, let's say. Mm -hmm. The, the uh, com uh, comparing and contrasting the two. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. So this is extremely difficult to do because really, um, uh, basically, I mean, although I skipped through some of them, but the references you had on the slides in front of you, that's, that's more or less the evidence there is. It's not as if I'm just being detective. <laughs> so um, uh, if, if we go by, so if we go by um, Xenophon's description of these Egyptians in, in action, which is the nearest thing we've, we've got, um, then he seems to suggest that the difference would be uh, between Egyptians and Greeks, um, that because these Egyptians have shields that reach to their feet, right, to, to the ground, he says, that they actually uh, presumably put them down, they, kind of, you know, they, 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 they rest them on the ground and they stand behind them and then they kind of shove forward uh, as a sort of uh, bulldozer type, uh, type arrangement. But... Um, uh, Whereas with the Greeks, so what we're told about the Greeks, and the similar vocabulary is used, but given that they've got round shields that are they're quite big, um, it's like three feet, you know, like almost a meter across, um, but they don't reach the ground. I mean, you really have to hold them up. Um, and they're, they're, sort of, they're sort of curved as well, um, uh, convex um, uh, shaped. Um, they, um, they would have to do this pushing and shoving if that's what they did under quite different conditions. Um, 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 you know, you might want to try this out and <laughs> see what the difference is between pushing against one another in close combat with convex round uh, balls versus, you know, big flat uh, uh, slabs that rest on the ground. Um, and I, so I think, although the vocabulary is quite, this, quite similar, um, the difference would have been quite significant. Um, and effectively, again, if Xenophon's description is correct, um, the Greek type of fighting would be would be less organized than that of the the, um, the Egyptians because they would have to be much more mobile. They would have to, you know, move those shields around, um, and um, they fight with um, with uh, uh, 
spears primarily, but secondly with swords as well. Um, Close combat as well. Mm. Yeah, uh, right, right. And it's, you actually quite need quite a lot of room to do that. Um, uh, the, the swords, um, especially, but and the spears also. When you use them, this gets very detailed. Sorry, but you know when you use oh, no, no, please. overhand. <laughs> so uh, there's a difference. I won't stand up and demonstrate, but I'll try to try to picture <laughs> when you use the spear kind of overhand. You know, and it's these are long, long weapons. They're like two, three meters, maybe even long. Um, if you raise those up, and you have people standing close behind you or in front of you, you're probably going to do more damage to your uh, your comrades than to to the enemy um so um you need to um you need to have quite a lot of room if you're going to fight in that way um if you're going to then draw your sword subsequently and wave that about and hacking on the enemy again you need space and with with the greek shield you can do that i guess with the egyptian shield it's harder to see how you would do that. Uh, you would perhaps is, Im, imagine more of a, like the stereotype of the Roman legion, right? The kind of a tortoise formation where they're all pushed together and there's, there's not a crack between them. Something along those lines, maybe what these Egyptians were capable of, according to Xenophon. And the Greeks actually would not have been able to achieve that with the kind of equipment they had. We have another question as well. Mm -hmm. Sorry, there is a lot of people engaging. Huh? Um, uh, it's from Ricardo. Uh, Lobo. Basically, he says, do you consider that in the battle of uh, uh, Gogamela, the phalanx was a formation that was decisive to win with a few against many more troops? Mm. There was any difference between hoplites and Macedonians in the type of phalanx adopted in battle? Thank you, Professor. Yeah, great. Yes, so absolutely. I'll take the second question first because that's really important. The um, So the Macedonian uh, phalanx uh, under Alexander, which fought this battle of, of Gogamela, um, is, I think, very different, actually, from, from the classical Greek hoplite that I was talking about. Um, not least because they fight, I mean, I mentioned long spears, two, three meters. I mean, they fight with these massive pikes, which you really need two hands to, to maneuver. Um, I mean, there's an endless debate about how long exactly. But, you know, we're talking about four, five, maybe even six meters long. Um, and so uh, these um, Macedonians, um, uh, Macedonian infantry uh, really um, stand very close. We have clear descriptions of that, unlike for classical Greek hoplites. They stand very close together. Um, they hold these pikes with two hands in a kind of overlapping. Um, they form this kind of, uh, if they raise them, a kind of hedgehog-like uh, sort of image of, you know, bristling with spears. So this is um, qu really quite different, I think, from, from how the Greeks uh, operate. Um, and so, um, that first, then you know whether they were decisive at Gorgamila. Or to be honest, I, I always find I find that quite hard to say, as I was suggesting earlier, for any battle. You know what? Who was decisive? Um, in that, um, in many in many cases, it you know the, the victory or defeat is determined by all the elements working together in a certain way. Um, and um, so, certainly, the infantry would do one um, decisive thing, which is to uh, hold a certain position. Now, this is one thing that they're very good at and they can move forward um, in, in a sort of steady way and hold ground. Um, but um, I'm, I'm actually no expert on the Macedonian army, let, let me say that now, but um, uh, it, it does seem clear that in the Macedonian army, cavalry you know, plays a very different role from what it did in the, the classical and, and earlier Greek armies. Um, it's cavalry is used on a much bigger scale in a vastly greater numbers. Um, and uh, so there's a, a large element of the fighting that relies on the, the mobility of the uh, of the cavalry uh, to move back and forth, to surround, to to go sideways, for that matter. Which um, Greek hoplites can do a bit, and I think Macedonian heavy infantry can't do at all. I think they can they can go forward and they can stand still, and they can probably go back slowly. As were, but they're they're not very mobile in that respect, and so this is why they play one crucial role. But it only works in combination with other uh, with other elements of the army. Fascinating stuff, especially to see how um, the tactics almost change when you get to kind of the Macedonian period, mm -hmm. and how almost the hoplite formation turns into something slightly different. And so, jumping on the back of that, um, yeah. one thing which I'll be very interested to know, Professor, is um, did sort of the formation, sort of equipment and tactics of hoplites stay fairly consistent throughout our period? Or were there um, some significant changes? And if so, what were they? Um, 
Yeah, uh, I think in terms of, um, so certainly there's a big change uh, between the, the, the classical and the Macedonian uh, the whole plight. Um, but going back, back further, um, yes, I, I do think there are changes that, this is, this is quite, um, quite a debated issue really. So I, I should say that up front. I think most scholars um, probably still think that um, around maybe 700 BC, you know, 50 years earlier or later, um, you get this change to hope like tactics and then it just stays like that for two or three, well, three centuries really. So that, that's one view that actually is very little change. Um, um, I, I, my, my argument would be that there is really significant change in sort of the middle of that period um, when um, the, the participation in the hoplite phalanx, I, I hinted at that earlier, the idea that the early phalanx tends to be quite small, you know, sort of a, a handful, not a handful, but a dozens or a few hundred quite rich uh, hoplites, whereas um, uh, let's say after 500 BC, uh, you've got thousands, if not 10,000 or 15,000, well, Let's not exaggerate, but let's say 10,000 uh, hoplites uh, taking part in a, in, in a battle, um, uh, of which a lot are people who can just about afford the equipment, but don't necessarily have a lot of, of training, uh, certainly don't go in for, you know, regular like drill exercises or whatever. So they're very much uh, amateurs who, um, you know, no doubt full of spirit and willing to fight, but there's a limit to, to what, they can, uh, what they can do. And so in a way, I think you, you then get these relatively close and dense formations as um, uh, a solution to getting large numbers of, of troops with not much training and experience uh, perhaps uh, to operate relatively effectively. Whereas before that, when you have these smaller more highly trained uh, and also probably more mixed uh, troops, uh, hope lights, heavy, very heavily armored hope lights, often with horses, you know, actually as well, um, if not actual cavalry, uh, but also with light arm, you know, so really mixed groups that they are much more fluid in a way than they, they can do more, they can do more things and more a greater range of things, but uh, less effectively insofar as they are much smaller numbers. So you then have a sort of slightly more nightly perhaps kind of uh, kind of fighting with a um, heavy armored elite uh, in, a, in a quite mixed uh, crowd doing all sorts of uh, different uh, things in, in battle um, and that that really I think changes quite significantly when you get towards the classical period and the the Persian wars and the Peloponnesian wars are then fought in quite a quite a different way. We have another question professor uh, from João um, Filasa he basically asks can we mark the battle of Sinocephale uh, mm. uh, in 97, uh, 197 BCE as the end of, of hoplite warfare, or is there any previous events that mark the, the demise mm, of yeah. hoplite phalanx warfare? Right, right. So this is another uh, Macedonian uh, phalanx. Act. So in terms of, as I defined that, so my definition of hoplite is, is very limited in that I think the Macedonian um, the Macedonian uh, infantryman is, I mean, he's, the sources still, you know, refer to them like that. But uh, as I say, I think he's quite a different type of, uh, of soldier. Um, so in terms of uh, the kind of hoplite warfare I've been talking about, um, that, I mean, that, that actually, it's difficult to answer that. I mean, it actually never quite goes away. I mean, um, the, because the, the Greek cities, the sort of smaller Greek city states, um, uh, find it quite difficult to, um, to create Macedonian style armies. Um, and so they tend to, for a long time, carry on with, uh, as it were, by then old fashioned hoplite uh, types. So in that respect, the hoplite never quite goes away, but he certainly becomes much less significant on you know the big international battlefields, you know, like the Battle of Kynos Kefale or you know Gogamila earlier on, and all the others you might care to mention for Alexander in the Hellenistic uh, period, um, the hoplite is maybe not that important in that. But at the same time, um, there's we don't hear much about it, but it's clear there's lots of smaller scale warfare still going on between Greek cities, you know, the, the, on the coast of Turkey or in mainland Greece. Um, and I think a lot of those are still fought by, um, by the hoplite, uh, you know, traditional hoplites. And it's only the, the major uh, Greek 
as opposed to sort of Macedo as opposed to the Macedonian kingdoms, the the more powerful of the Greek states like Thebes, for example, that eventually, really quite late, like in the in the third century BC, um, uh, so you know, like a century after Alexander, um, start beginning to try and create uh, uh, Macedonian style armies, which means you know they have to put a lot of money into creating these more or less professional troops and, and providing them with that equipment. So uh, again, this is I'm sure not a very satisfactory answer, but depending on how you def define the hope, like he, he either never quite goes away uh, or you know he's, he's pretty much over by the time uh, Philip of Macedon and, and Alexander come onto the scene. And our colleague Pedro here has um, more of a curiosity as well, if Professor knows. So, um, uh, speaking about uh, um, archaeology and uh, nowadays uh, with the paleo osteology, that we can basically um, see how the bones were, the formation of the bones, and stuff like that. Anatomically speaking, um, there is any remains found, or for example, hoplites, that we can find any marks on the bones that suggest the heaviness of the shields and stuff like that? Ah, yes, yeah, that would be that would be very interesting. Um, yes, there'd be massive uh, advances in that, but um, I. In, in principle, I think that might that might be possible. You know, if you if you found, um, I, I should say that the reason um, that, so far as I know, and you know, and I'm not necessarily completely up to date with the latest um, research of that type, but um, uh, so far as I know, we we haven't yet been able to detect that. It's partly because uh, Greeks are are really keen on on cremation, <laughs> so that they uh, yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, not it, not every I have to say not everywhere, but um, it, it's it's quite a common uh, a common uh, way of disposing of the dead, and especially actually for the war dead, I think it's almost like a special honor in some cases, uh, which means I mean that doesn't mean the bones completely disappear, but the skeletons clearly don't survive well enough to be able to see what kind of stresses they've been under. So oddly enough, we, we tend to find out a bit more about, you know, where you've got um, um, the, uh, the skeletons of, uh, you know, of like female skeletons uh, uh, who are, who've not been uh, cremated like warriors, then you can quite often see that they're all, you know, they're, they're, their limbs, their, their joints are all worn out and they've got poor dental health and, you know, all that sort of thing. Um, but sadly, it's not so obvious for soldiers. Sometimes, you know, you do find, um, uh, like a skull with with clear uh, you know damage inflicted on it, uh, and the famous this is not very recent at all, but there's this, the famous uh, Macedonian uh, skull recovered that clearly had its uh, its eye poked out at some point, and you know which we are told about Philip II of Macedon. So there's a famous like forensic reconstruction of that skull that makes him look exactly like Philip uh, Philip II. Um, so we have that, but it would be I, I'm sure it's a very interesting prospect really i'm sure that you know as as the this sort of scientific analysis continues we'll be able to tell more and more um about uh, what what fighting uh, did to people because despite what i said about cremation uh, it's not universally the, the right everywhere um and unfortunately you know, most of the older excavations where skeletons were recovered um they, they could barely be bothered to try and decide whether it was male or female or, you know, or what age, never mind do this very detailed analysis. But that's clearly completely changed and we've, we've got a lot of interesting stuff to look forward to, I think. Um, and I, I, we, it's been quite remarkable because a lot of people is interacting with us. So I have another okay. question um, from Gonzalo again. He said, Professor mentioned Phoenicians uh, have yeah. their hoplites too. So, were they original uh, originally found uh, founded by Greek uh, by Greek hoplites during the colonization periods? Um, and another question is if the if the people um, uh, were originally Phoenicians uh, and the relation uh, between. Oh, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the first the first question is certainly a very good one in that um, um, some of the uh, well the, the evidence from Herodotus that I mentioned. Um, dates to the late fifth century BC, at which point there's been quite a long, a long period of uh, interaction between Greeks and uh, Greece and Phoenicia. So one could argue um, that Phoenicians have maybe copied this from from the Greeks, and it's not an independent or early invention. Um, but this is partly why I um, I put in the the quite you know the the relatively early evidence of the uh, the ostrich egg and the and the silver bowl because that that takes us back to 
round about the same time, not exactly, but round about the same time that the Greeks are first you know, showing signs of adopting this kind of equipment. Um, and, uh, and I should say as well, the um, Greeks don't really, um, as it were, colonize these areas and they don't go and settle there until after, well, after Alexander. Um, so it, it's not that the, you know, it, by the fourth century, there's a lot of influ Greek influence um, uh, in, in Phoenicia. Um, but I think even in the fifth century, never mind in the seventh century BC, um, it's quite, it's more likely, I think, that they independently developed that than that they copied it from the, from the Greeks. Um, but it's true, I, I can't strictly prove that. I mean, if I, I don't have ninth, like say ninth, ninth century BC evidence to show that the Phoenicians got there first. And, and, and my point is also not really um, who invented it, you know, was it the Phoenicians or the Greeks um, or, you know, or someone else. But really just to emphasize that it seems to me quite possible that similar types of uh, arms and armor and therefore similar types of fighting were developed in, in quite a number of places, different places, uh, more or less at the same time or, you know, or indeed much earlier. I mean, I showed you the, the Bronze Age Egyptian uh, example, it's slightly different equipment, but in some ways fundamentally the same. I could have um, gone back to the third millennium uh, BC even and showed you something called the, the vulture steel, which is very famous and, and often shown in these kind of contexts. But then people say, well, uh, uh, what that shows is, is third millennium BC in, in uh, Mesopotamia. Uh, again, uh, well, essentially it looks very much like a Macedonian phalanx, even in uh, pikemen really with long pikes held with both hands, uh, big shields, very close order. Um, but, but this sort of stands on its own for about, you know, the, for the next millennium. So people say, well, I don't know what that is. You know, it's, a, it's a blip. It's a one off. Um, but again, I would say, well, it just goes to show that this type of fighting is discovered and rediscovered frequently um, whenever it becomes useful. And, and the real question is, when does it become useful to people? Um, the, the issue about um, uh, what Phoenicians are, I mean, this is not something, again, something I'm an expert on, but I, I, I'm aware there is a... Uh, a big debate about, as it were, the, the identity or the ethnic identity of Phoenicians. So to be uh, to be fair, I mean, f the word Phoenicians that I use is, is a Greek name for uh, a group of people that they collectively call, uh, call by that name. Um, uh, they, they didn't, whoever they were, they didn't call themselves that. It was just a Greek way of saying those, those people over there, that is to say, and essentially in, in, in around the Lebanon. Um, uh, see so, you know, they sort of overlap with what um, um, in biblical terms the like Canaanites, for example, you know, they themselves might have only identified themselves as you know members of people of a particular city like Sidon. Again, sorry, that's the Greek name. I'm not even sure what it's called in Phoenician or, or Tyre uh, and so forth. So um, I certainly wouldn't want to commit to any um, uh, any view that. Um, there really was like a, a nation called the Phoenicians who adopted all this kind of equipment. Um, but um, people in the area of the, the, the Lebanon and maybe southern, uh, sorry, western uh, Syria um, uh, were associated by the Greeks with that type of equipment already. And some of the evidence might suggest that they, that they used it. Another question from Dorian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then uh, Daniel Jacint basically he asks what changes to overall grand strategy not tactics mm -hmm. did the appearance of the op uh, of the um, oplites and the phalanx bring to warfare did the, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the preferred terrain changed? Did ambushes become more frequent due to the harm factor? Uh, is there a shift of preference trading routes due to the resources? Mm -hmm. It's more than very, one question. Yes, right, right, <laughs> yes, very interesting question. So um, um, I think I, I hinted earlier at uh, one uh, scholarly view on that, which actually suggests that the initial appearance of the hoplite and the phalanx almost kind of narrowed down warfare. I mean, that there was almost, there was almost no such thing as grand strategy anymore. It's just um, you walk across the border and you, you spend an afternoon fighting your neighbor and then you walk back again. And uh, you know, who, whoever killed the most people is quite happy because they won. You know, and this, this, so there's no, this, it's a bit of a caricature, but I don't exaggerate much. That is a view of, of early Greek warfare. Uh, and on that view, it's, you know, grand uh, strategies emerge only 
much later, maybe in the fifth century. The Peloponnesian War is often mentioned as one where um, much more ambitious uh, military goals than, than came into play. But um, so I would I would say that that is probably not um, not true. Um, um, I'm tempted to say almost that um, the appearance of, um, of of hoplites in the phalanx it didn't really change um, sort of higher level strategies and, and uh, ambitions in warfare, you know, goals of warfare, very much. And they were just uh, pursued by by different means, so that the uh, the hoplite um, becomes a, an element of how you fight. And this is. Uh, you know, this is one of my, my hobby horses, and I can't stress it enough, but it's so important not to buy into, you know, the, the Greek self-representation, which suggests hoplites are it, you know, there's no, was nobody else is doing anything useful in time of war, um, that actually at all times, um, there are, you know, really at fairly early dates, there are usually ships involved and the manpower that you need for uh, for the ships the rowers and the you know and the uh, the marines and the and the sailors and so forth um there's usually horses involved in some kind of capacity either as cavalry or at least as transport um there are archers there are you know well all sorts of uh, of, of aspects of warfare which can pursue the kind of goals that hope lights can't um and you know it, we can't go that far back in time in, in greek history because the, you know the records for what people were fighting about you know what they were fighting for or over just uh you do not exist um again which actually is one reason why it's commonly assumed all they fight for is you know like borderland you know they just want they just want an extra small strip of land um just because, you know, because this is, is good to expand. Um, but um, I think, uh, again, from as early back as we can tell, which is really not much back before, like 700 BC, um, uh, there's reason to think that there were more ambitious goals. That, and certainly by 600 BC, I think you, you, I can identify pretty clear evidence for like international military alliances which you know, which you don't make in order to just invade your neighbor and fight over a strip of land. There, it implies much grander ambitions, and you can find evidence already again, 600 maybe BC, maybe earlier, um, for the mobilization of fleets, which again, you know, have, clearly have a different uh, uh, purpose. Um, so I would say um, it, it is quite hard to tell, for lack of evidence, really what most earlier Greek wars were about. But I think we can infer that. There was um, a degree of, of grand strategy of, of, of conquest, of establishing hegemony of various kinds uh, from, a, from a very early date uh, till the end of the, the classical period, at least. Thank you so much, Professor. And our time is reaching an end, unfortunately, and we don't want to keep you more than the hour that we agree with. Yeah. Um, I will ask if you want to do any final remarks um, about the subject uh, or... Well, Perhaps I've, uh, I've I've said a lot already. I I, I do want to say I enjoyed I, the, the questions have been uh, uniformly excellent. I mean, very much um, to the point and on exactly the sort of topics that uh, I find so interesting about about Greek warfare. And I and I hope you know that that um, uh, by taking what in some respects is a bit um, an unusual line, I suppose it's uh, it, it's I'm not completely um you know off the wall as you were in, in my views on greek warfare but um it's probably still a more or less a minority view as to you know what the significant aspects and the nature of the development of greek warfare is uh, i hope i've uh, persuaded maybe one or two uh, of the <laughs> there is something something in that but i've, I've very much enjoyed this and appreciate uh, your questions uh, very much no, thank you so much uh, uh, professor from my end um and obviously thank you everyone who watches us and who make these brilliant questions as well to, to the professor. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Peter, as well. Um, sure. And see you again in the next episode of Confabulating. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah.